Uh, okay. Um, welcome, committee members, to the eighth meeting of the committee in 2016. Um, can I remind all members who are in attendance to switch off their phones or at least put them into a mode that we cannot hear? Uh, agenda item one involves taking evidence on the Scotland Bill from our witnesses, and we have the Right Honourable David Mundell, MP, the Secretary of State for Scotland. Um, I've got to say, David, it looks slightly unusual seeing you sitting down there in the corner of the, our room on the television, yeah. but, it's, but it's good to have you here. Um, I, I, can I thank you, first of all, uh, and, uh, and the Scotland Office for agreeing to give evidence to the committee this evening. I'm aware that you may have to leave uh, us if there's a requirement for you to vote in the House of Commons uh, during the evidence session. That means you, you won't be able to return probably for a sustained period, Secretary of State, um, therefore, uh, as you go through the lobbies, etc. And that event, and given that the committee has now made significant efforts to accommodate this, and particularly down the, uh, in regard to the, the video evidence, I propose at that stage, just for the simplicity, to end that session um, at that point, and we'll seek to rearrange another evidence session um, with you as soon as possible. I think that's probably the best way to deal with that. But, Secretary, I believe you want to uh, make an opening statement. Uh, which I'd, we're more than grateful, obviously, for you to do. But at the same time, because we don't know, could you just introduce us to who the officials are at the same time, if you don't mind, Secretary? Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Crawford. I, uh, I did notice that you'd put me on the floor, I, uh, but uh, we will we will, we'll try to look up as we give our, uh, as we give our evidence. Uh, and I'm extremely grateful to the committee for facilitating my appearance by this uh, video link because I have been uh, required in Westminster today for parliamentary business, as you uh, mentioned. I am accompanied by James Dowler, who has appeared before the committee before, the director, uh, Deputy Director for Constitutional Policy at the Scotland Office, uh, and by Lindsay White, who is the Deputy Director Devolution at Her Majesty's Treasury. I have said before how valuable uh, I regard the work of your committee in scrutinising the Scotland Bill and I reiterate that, and I'm pleased to be able to give evidence today uh, as the lead minister for the bill. I'm delighted to be able to give that evidence to you this evening with agreement having been reached between Scotland's two governments on a new fiscal framework for Scotland. I made clear in the House of Commons a short time ago that I will make a statement to the House of Commons uh, tomorrow in relation to the fiscal framework in order uh, that members of uh, this Parliament can have the same opportunity uh, as you have had uh, to hear about uh, the fiscal uh, framework. Um, you will be aware that the Chief Secretary to the Treasury has led on the fiscal framework negotiations for the UK Government and he has committed to give evidence to the Scottish Parliament once an agreement is reached, which is now, and he will be able to provide, I think, the Finance Committee more detailed technical information uh, on the agreement. The Scotland Bill completed its committee stage in the House of Lords yesterday and begins report stage tomorrow. We now approach the concluding stages of the legislation and are mindful of the further opportunities for scrutiny from both parliaments that the coming weeks uh, do allow and indeed the need for the Scottish Parliament to debate and pass a legislative consent motion. Uh, Mr Crawford, I think we will agree that the new uh, Scottish Parliament elected in May will be a very different from its predecessor. The new powers contained in the Scotland Bill will make it one of the most powerful devolved parliaments in the world. It will, in effect, be a new Scottish Parliament. Lord Smith con has confirmed that the Bill delivers the legislation required to honour the cross-party Smith Agreement. I am confident that now we have agreed the fiscal framework that is fair and built to last, we can deliver a Scotland Act that delivers a strong Scottish Parliament within the strong United Kingdom, which the people of Scotland voted for. Thank you, Secretary of State, for that opening statement. Um, of course, this now turns to the, this committee to examine and scrutinise the agreement that has been ar ar arrived at by the two governments and come to our own <coughs> conclusion about whether or not the agreement represents a good deal for Scotland before we make our recommendations to the Scottish Parliament. I just wonder, uh, just to help us understand the, the, the background to this, could you confirm, as was suggested this afternoon um, in the Scottish Parliament, that at the beginning of this negotiation process, that the, 
um, Scot the, the, the Scotland's budget would have been down by a, a level of potential detriment of £7 billion. And that this afternoon, that number stands, if the agreement holds, at zero. You won't be surprised to, to learn that I don't see it in those terms. This has been a negotiation. A negotiation is concluded with an agreement. Obviously, there's been various comment made during the negotiation process. But what's important in a negotiation is the agreement that's reached. And as you've indicated, your committee, uh, indeed the Parliament as a whole, indeed this Parliament, will look at the agreement that's been reached and it will determine whether that agreement is fair to Scotland and fair to the rest of the United Kingdom. I believe that it is. Well, I accept that, but obviously there's been significant public comment, and we've got to make a decision by the time we get to make a recommendation to the Parliament. So can I ask you again, uh, is, it, is it to confirm that at the beginning of this process, the detriment to Scotland's budget would have been ten, potentially £7 billion, and this afternoon, following the agreement, it's zero? The process was to reach an agreement. An agreement has been reached, and it is the agreement, not the, the, scru not the negotiation process, uh, as I understand it, that's uh, open for a uh, scrutiny. I think during uh, the... I don't have to leave for that bell, you will be pleased to know. Intentionally, but... <laughs> oh, you... As far as I'm aware, I don't have to leave for that bit. I can't hear anything now. Um, th th thank you, Secretary of State. Just, let me just complete that bit. Do you have to go for that one? No. It is a vote, but I'm not sure. Yeah, we'll wait. Just for the record, we'll wait, Secretary of State, till the bell stops and then we'll start again. There okay, we are. We'll, try, we'll, we'll try to proceed. Let's see how we get on. I'm just, I'm just so glad for electronic voting in the Scottish Parliament. Um, okay, let me, let me avoid going back over that same question, but ask it a slightly different way. Can, can we confirm that today the impact on the Scottish budget following the agreement would be no detriment? Yes. Okay, thank you. The, well, the Scottish, yes, the Scottish budget will not uh, be a, uh, the Scottish budget will not be reduced on the basis of the agreement that's been reached uh, today. I think for that I'll pass to Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, uh, good evening, Secretary of State. Um, can you just can, you've just confirmed that there will be no detriment um, during the transitional period, this five or six years period? that was uh, uh, spoken about by the First Minister in her statement to Parliament this afternoon. But can you just confirm that um, at the end of that period, it will be ne necessary for both governments to agree um, what will happen after that? So in other words, a, a joint agreement, and no, no one government can enforce any future um, model on the other at that stage. It's an agreement by both governments. Yes, the, the two governments have agreed that these arrangements will be reviewed 
uh, following the UK and Scottish Parliament elections in 2020 and 2021 respectively, allowing an assessment at that time and in light of a Parliament's worth of experience of the best way of achieving a fair, transparent and effective outcome in line with all of the Smith principles. The review will be informed by an independent report with recommendations presented to both governments by the end of 2021. The fiscal framework does not include or assume the method for adjusting the block grant beyond the transitional period. The two governments will jointly agree that method as part of the review. The method adopted will deliver results consistent with the Smith Commission's recommendations, including the principles of no detriment, taxpayer fairness and economic responsibility. Thank you for that. Can I just follow that up with a, another question? If at the point you, you have the transitional period, you have the review, you have the negotiation between the two governments, if they cannot come to an agreement at that point, does the transitional um, position carry on until such time as an agreement is reached? Or is there, a, is there an end date at which something else happens? It's, in, it's envisaged that the, both governments would uh, uh, receive the report by the end uh, of 2021. Uh, uh, and the, tw the transitional period is, is due to end uh, in 2022. So I, I think uh, on the basis of the uh, experience that, that we've had in reaching this agreement, the good faith demonstrated that and with the independent element to uh, the analysis that it will be possible for the governments to reach agreement by the time the transitional period ends uh, in 2022. I'm sure we'd all welcome that, that being the case, but I'm asking you, if there's not an agreement at that point, would the no detriment principle carry on beyond that date or, or what would happen? What, what isn't going to happen is a suggestion that any methodology would be uh, enforced. A, uh, what, uh, if the governments clearly couldn't reach uh, agreement on a, uh, the outcome of uh, the review, they would, have to, they would have to reach agreement as to what happened in uh, the short term until uh, they were able to uh, reach an agreement. Yeah, no, well, let's... Davish, do you want to come in on that area? <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Kavino. Uh, good evening, Secretary of State. I wonder if I can ask just a couple of follow-on questions to Stuart Maxwell's. Um, first of all, in overall terms, when will this committee see the overall t uh, um, agreement that has been reached? Uh, we were told this, mo this morning in Parliament it would be by the end of this week. Is that your understanding as well? That's my understanding. And I think, you know, to be fair to our colleagues in... Uh, the Scottish, Scottish Government. As I understand it, it is the third reading of the uh, Scottish Budget uh, Bill uh, tomorrow. Uh, I mean, clearly, the, you know, there is an immediate pressure. Uh, uh, so officials are working as diligently as possible uh, to have the full agreement uh, produced. But it would be unrealistic to say that it would be available tomorrow. We're working towards uh, the end of the week, and I, I give the undertaking that everything possible will be done to get it to you as expeditiously as possible. So that's absolutely fine. Just on the review that you were discussing with Mr. Maxwell, who will be the independent body? Uh, that uh, will be agreed by the governments. So it's yet to be decided, or is this kind of being made up as we go along? It's not being a, uh, made up as, as uh, we're going uh, along. Uh, we uh, accept the need uh, for uh, the body to be, uh, for the review to, to have an independent uh, element. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many uh, within the Scottish Parliament who will have views on what, how that uh, independent aspect of the review uh, will be best achieved. Okay, I take your point. It's not yet decided, and, and uh, it, that will not be a detail that's present in the, in the, uh, in the formal uh, papers that we'll receive by the end of this week, I'm assuming. The, the, form, the formal papers will confirm that the, the, the independent uh, element of it, but I, I'm sure, Mr Scott, you, you, know, you appreciate that there uh, the, the will require to be some agreement as to who uh, and what is independent. There are a number of people who hold themselves out, uh, as independent within Scotland, but uh, it may not necessarily be so. Well, there we are. That could take six years to negotiate too. Um, 
Could I uh, just ask one final question, if I may, Convener? Um, you said to Mr. Maxwell that the transition ends in 2022 uh, and the negotiations between the governments would only begin after the elections of 2020 and 2021. So, uh, assuming the elections are in May of 2021, that leaves you, or it leaves the, the, the governments of the day or the, or the ministers of the day, the period, would I be fair in assuming from May, June 2021 through to the end of the financial year 2022 to resolve this and put in place the, whatever is going to be put in place? Well, the, the, there is a requirement that has been built into uh, the agreement that uh, the review must be completed by the end of 2021. So the review will be completed by the end uh, of 2021. Yes, there will be a, a relatively short period until uh, the end of the, of the transitional period, but I think that it will be uh, in both governments' interests uh, to conclude uh, an agreement within uh, that timescale. And as I've always been confident that we would be able to agree the fiscal framework, I'm confident uh, that with goodwill uh, such an agreement would be capable of being uh, reached. Indeed. And, and would, the, uh, would the work that's being done to inform that review, such as the independent analysis that you've described this evening, is it envis envisaged that that would be done earlier than uh, 2021? Uh, or at what point would that be carried out? It's a, envisaged that it would be concluded after a, the, the 2021 Scottish Parliament uh, election so that it, it, both parliaments had effectively a, you know, the next Scottish Parliament has a full parliament in which uh, to see how these arrangements work in practice. Uh, and that, a, uh, and obviously not, you know, to come forward in the period immediately prior to elections, which, as we uh, discover, sometimes uh, makes agreement and discussion less uh, easy to facilitate. Glad you've made that point. Thank you. Listen, did you want to come in on the review as well? I just wanted to seek clarity on that point that we wouldn't be in a similar process before the next election. So. That Content with that, convener. Thank you. Can I, can I ask one further question about the membership of this, or, or the process of the establishing the independent group? Um, while we might not know who the members are, because it's some time away before we would be required to know that, I think understanding what the mechanism would be for appointing these, and how and how that would jointly be gone about, would be something that this committee would want some assurance on. Um, before such time as we signed off on the Scotland Bill, whatever recommendation we finally make, can, can you give us some assurance that, that will, at least that, the mechanisms uh, and the, uh, can be as transparent as possible and we'll be able to see what these are? What I, I, I'm happy to, to do, Mr Crawford, is, is to raise that directly uh, with uh, Mr Swinney so that we can, uh, we can bring forward... Uh, something uh, for you, but, but uh, you know, as, I under as, as I understand it, you know, the exact detail of that mechanism uh, was, was not, it's not part of the agreement. Sorry, Sorry Stuart Maxwell. Sorry, Secretary of State. Just, uh, just to clarify something you said there, I, I'm, I think I'm right in saying, you've just said that the review um, will, is due to be completed by the end of 2021. Is that correct? That is correct. Correct. And the agreement should then take effect effectively from, I imagine, the financial year following, which is April. So effectively, are, we say, are you saying that the, the, the whole thing will have to be agreed by the two governments in effectively a 12-week period? I'm saying that, that's, that, that the transition period ends uh, on, at, at the end of the financial year in 2022. I don't see why the two governments shouldn't be capable uh, of reaching an agreement in a 12-week period. And sometimes, uh, you know, Mr Maxwell, what happens is that when you have a short time, uh, a really short time to reach agreement, those, those provide the circumstances and uh, the compelling reason to reach agreement, uh, whereas a longer time doesn't necessarily lead to agreement being reached in, uh, expeditiously. Yeah, I, 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 hopefully I share your optimism about a 12-week period, but I go back to my original question um, from earlier. Given it's, it's such a short period, you've said yourself it's a very short period, 
if at the point after 12 weeks that there is no agreement, which is perfectly possible, let's hope it doesn't happen, but it's perfectly possible, can you confirm that is your understanding that the no detriment will carry on after that 12-week period? What I, what I can confirm is that no mechanism would be imposed at the end of that uh, period without uh, agreement. If we were not able to, you know, if we were not able to reach agreement on what on what was to happen a, uh, in the longer term post 2022, we would have to agree what was to happen in the short term. But there would be no uh, there would be no arrangement imposed uh, on the Scottish government. Okay, thank you. Uh, McMillan, did you want to come in on issues to do with borrowing? Uh, yes, can I just one brief supplementary on that point, on, on the previous question first? <coughs> just, uh, just uh, Secretary of State, uh, just uh, regarding your comments there uh, on this review, um, is it, therefore, is it not a possibility that, that the situation that we've just had actually could be replicated again because of the, the, the local authority elections to take place in Scotland in 2022? I... Um, think that there are always uh, reasons, uh, that you, reasons not, uh, to, uh, not to agree. Obviously there are, but I think the, the fact that, the, that we've had a full Scottish Parliament uh, is really the, the determining factor in, in, in setting the review date. There will have been a full term of the Scottish Parliament, uh, and I think that that, you know, that, that is what, what shaped uh, the date. Inevitably, in, in Scotland, there are always elections, uh, it seems, in every year that could be said that would have some degree of influence. But I think the fact that we wouldn't be immediately before a UK general election or a Scottish Parliament election uh, it, it would be important. I don't diminish, by the way, uh, local government elections. They're very, uh, they're, they're very important. But I don't think uh, that they would be uh, a factor in influencing uh, a failure to, to reach agreement. Uh, no, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, certainly, this morning, uh, the Deputy First Minister, uh, understandably, uh, didn't want to go into any financial uh, figures regarding the borrowing, but uh, are you in a position now to tell the committee as to what the borrowing limit is going to be for Scotland, please? I, I am able to say that we've agreed uh, that the Scottish Government will have substantial new borrowing powers. This will ensure that the Scottish Government can manage its budget effectively and invest up to £3 billion in vital uh, infrastructure. And as set out in the Smith Agreement, we will provide the Scottish Government with uh, £200 million to set up and administer uh, the new powers uh, that it will uh, control. Uh, thank you for that. Can, I, can, I, can you just confirm that, that is that the, that's the level that the Scottish Government actually were looking for? What, a, um, you know, what, the, what we've, we've done is reach an agreement. A, I, I think myself, uh, you know, sticking to generally as we've managed to, you know, it, 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 it's not a, uh, appropriate to have a commentary on offer and counter uh, offer. Uh, what, ha you know, what has been agreed is, is what has been agreed, and I think you know, it's that agreement uh, which uh, is to be scrutinised and determined if it's going to be uh, fair uh, and appropriate uh, for the Scottish Government's needs as identified in the, the Smith uh, Commission. No problem. Thank you very much. Mark MacDonald had one last question on the fiscal stuff, and I want to move on then, Secretary of State, to areas of the Scotland Bill itself, just to conclude the evidence taking session. Mark MacDonald. Sorry, Alec Johnson wants to come in after well, Mark MacDonald. Uh, it, go, it, goes, it goes slightly wider, and it, it, it goes back to the beginning, um, Secretary of State. You, you spoke about the, um, the powers coming into effect in the next Parliament. And I just wanted to ask you, in terms of the timescale, mm -hmm. once the Bill has concluded its passage, um, there was discussion at the beginning of this process about how some powers would be, uh, would be easier to devolve uh, at an early stage compared to others. And if you look at, for example, SRIT, which was included within the 2012 
Scotland Act uh, is now only just recently come into effect. Uh, I appreciate that much of the groundwork that has been laid through that will make it easier for future devolution. But is, there, is, is it likely that all powers will transfer as a package or is there likely to be some that will transfer earlier than others? Are you able to give any indication on timescales? It, it, it's the intention that the tax powers would be transferred uh, in time for April 2017. Uh, and that, therefore, in the, if, if effectively the next budget of the new Scottish Parliament, uh, that that budget would take place in the context of, uh, of, the, new, uh, of the new powers. I, uh, obviously, that you know, continues to have to be agreed uh, with the Scottish Government. But I think the point you make is a very good one, uh, is that although it's of, the SRT is often you know, not particularly heralded, the fact is that it has laid the groundwork for a lot of the arrangements with the new, uh, uh, the new tax uh, uh, powers. Uh, so that income t the income tax powers can come into place uh, in, in April 2017 because of that groundwork, such as, you know, as from this April, the new coding arrangements will be in place. They don't need to be, uh, they don't need to be tested. Uh, they don't need to be tested out. My understanding uh, is that it is the shared view of both governments that the, wealth, the transfer of the welfare powers should be on the basis of agreement through our joint ministerial uh, group on, on welfare. Uh, there, are different, uh, uh, you know, there are different levels of arrangement. The, the two governments are working extremely well uh, in relation to taking those powers forward. Uh, and just for the record, uh, to, to the convener who's off screen, uh, can I commend both Alec Neal and Rosanna Cunningham, uh, you know, who have worked particularly constructively with my colleagues Ian Duncan Smith and Priti Patel, in, and the way in which officials between the Scottish Government and the UK Government have worked in order to smooth the transition of those welfare powers. But they will come on stream on a basis that is in, agreed by both, by both governments. Okay, I think the, the reason why I'm asking is that obviously if we're looking at a six-year period, transitional period with a review at the end of it, I think it's important to understand for how much of that transitional period uh, the Parliament will essentially have control of certain areas because obviously um, that would influence the effectiveness of any review. So um, I, I appreciate you maybe can't give definitive timescales, but an indication of where the thinking is from the UK government's perspective about how long it will take for some of these powers to be devolved. I mean, you've sp spoken about April 2017 for the taxes, and that's very welcome. But in terms of some of the other policy areas, I think it would be good to get an understanding of the likely timescale, or at least the envisaged timescale, from the UK government's perspective? Well, my envisaged timetable is that a uh, subject, obviously, to the Parliament uh, bringing forward uh, its legislative uh, con consent uh, motion and the uh, bill proceeding to royal assent ahead of the Scottish Parliament elections, a number of the powers will be in place almost immediately after uh, the Scottish Parliament elections. Uh, there are a number of uh, one of the, the other tax powers, for example, air passenger duty can be transferred at the point that the Scottish Government has its model ready for that, for that transfer. So if, if the model, is, you know, if, if the arrangements are available uh, you know, shortly after the Scottish Parliament election, we would be able to transfer them. So in relation to, uh, to the, the wider powers and, and the wider tax, we, 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 we place no impediment in relation to the transfer of those powers. The welfare powers... You know, I think from both our perspectives, and we've agreed this in the Joint Ministerial Committee, just are slightly different in the sense that everybody has to be very confident that the new arrangements are in place and working. So that you know, when, some, when a, for example, a, your personal independence payments were switched off from a UK basis, that the new arrangement is in place because we can't leave you know, vulnerable people in a, in a vacuum. So we, w we are working very, very closely to ensure that when the switchover takes place of the welfare powers, that everything is in place to, uh, you know, to allow that 
uh, to happen. And I'm, I'm confident on the basis of the good working relations that we have that that will, uh, that will indeed be the case. Okay. Thank you, Secretary. I think it would be quite useful if we could ask you to set some of this out in a letter to us um, so that we can have that in front of us, so we can uh, have a bit more of the detail, uh, an explanation. If, some, if, we, if we don't know exactly wh when some of the powers will be in place, what the mechanism is to enable that, I think that would be very useful to us. And no, that I, can I, I pass be, across I to Alec, be, Alec, Alec Johnson. To, sorry, I, I, would be sorry. Very happy to, to, I would be very happy to do that. And I think it would be also probably helpful for the committee without... Um, you know, suggest, being over, uh, uh, it, it, over much suggesting, though, uh, it, you know, that the Scottish Government do set out how they, you know, how they also envisage dovetailing with that process, because it is a dovetailing process, and I can't, you know, I want to transfer air passenger duty as soon as I can, but I do require the Scottish Government to tell me what it is, you know, when they want that to happen and what transitional methodology they want us to put in place. Yeah, of course we would be asking the, the Scottish Government to do the same, um, but we'll decide that. Alec. Yeah, thank you. Q convener. I'm uh, very encouraged to hear that intergovernmental relations have been developing so constructively during this process. But the question I'd like to ask the Secretary of State is, uh, if he envisages the Scottish Fiscal Commission having a role within the fiscal framework? We do uh, en envisage the uh, Scottish Fiscal uh, Commission having an important uh, role, and we have we have set out a, 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 as part as as will become part, uh, clear as part of the fiscal uh, framework that a uh, you know, that, that the commission uh, the, 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 that commission does require to be uh, independent in its uh, operation. Uh, and the Scottish Government have uh, agreed uh, to that. So in, in the arrangement, there is a modification to the proposals which they had previously uh, put forward to uh, ensure uh, th that degree of independence, uh, which I think, uh, we, I, I think uh, certainly your colleagues uh, in, in the Scottish Parliament have argued for. But would that... Um the, the usefulness of the, the fiscal, Scottish Fiscal Commission within this process, would that be entirely dependent on ensuring that the, uh, it was strengthened uh, and in a position to wield that power and decisions effectively? Well, it's been, it's been agreed as part of the uh, fiscal framework agreement that that's what will uh, happen and you know, the, the detail of that will emerge in the, the documentation which, which you'll see before the end of the week. But the Scottish Government have agreed uh, that, uh, the, the, uh, that the, those strengthening arrangements should be uh, put in place to ensure uh, that uh, independence uh, that you refer to. Thank you. Okay. But again, for the, re for the record, Mr Crawford, I do want, I do want to commend again, uh, because, because Mr Johnson referred to intergovernmental relations, and although you know, we've, uh, we haven't always seen eye to eye, you know, I do assure the committee that, that these arrangements have been conducted uh, you know, with the utmost cordiality. Uh, and throughout that process, Mr Swinney and I have always uh, been able to uh, you know, have robust discussion but engage cordially uh, throughout the process. And I think that that does uh, you know, stand us in very good stead for uh, the further development of intergovernmental uh, relationships in the way that we would all want to see. Well, probably an appropriate place to go on that would be into the Scotland Bill and the Crown Estate, because obviously there's a fair bit to go on that yet. And Rob Gibson, I think, would like to ask a couple of questions in that regard. Good evening, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, our committee wrote recently to the Treasury expressing a number of areas of concern that the committee has where we consider that the draft memorandum of understanding and the statutory transfer scheme appear to be too restrictive and lack clarity for the Crown Estate. So what's your view on the concerns of the committee uh, that we've expressed? Uh, my view is, I mean, the Treasury is, uh, my understanding from Treasury colleagues is that they are going to uh, respond fully to the, uh, to, uh, the points uh, that you uh, have made. We are still uh, uh, engaged in, in some uh, uh, discussion 
uh, directly uh, with the Scottish Government in relation to uh, uh, the arrangements uh, for, uh, for the Crown Estate. Uh, so, I, I, you know, the, the committee's uh, views will be, uh, you know, will be taken cognizance of, but the methodology of, in, in by which we approach the Crown Estate is something, you know, which we have, you know, which, which, which has been agreed. Well, is that re report back from the Treasury to us going to take place in time for us to scrutinise this before the legislative consent, consent motion? Yes, I will underta I'll undertake to ensure that, it, along with the, uh, you know, along with the other documentation, that you have that response by the end of this week. So, if there's a need for full consultation about uh, the process, you know, uh, it would probably be. Uh, during the next session of this Parliament. And therefore, you know, in session five, um, would it be possible for the draft transfer scheme to be consulted at that time so that uh, the new Parliament can come to a, con a considered view with regard to what is an offer? Because it would obviously be them who'd have the job of implementing it. I'll, I'll, I'll take... Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not unsympathetic to the point that you're uh, that, that you're making, but I would have to double check in terms of, of, of uh, process because I'm, I'm not a um, I'm not fully cons uh, you know conversant with the, the, the crossover processes between a uh, uh, Parliament and these arrangements. But what I'll do, Mr. Gibson, is I'll specifically write to you uh, on that uh, on that point, and again by the end of this. On, by the end of this week. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Alison Johnson, I think Secretary of State, wanted to ask a question around post-study work visas. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, we took some evidence on this issue a couple of weeks ago, and I think it, it was very striking. Um, we had a couple of witnesses who'd benefited from being part of the Fresh Talent Initiative. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look at any of that evidence yet, but I just wonder if you agree with Scotland's business directors, such as the Institute of Directors, other organisations like University Scotland and the STUC, that a post-study work visa scheme should be reintroduced in Scotland? Well, my position, as I've set out when I appeared before the Scottish Affairs uh, Select Committee uh, recently on this very issue, is that I uh, am looking at their report uh, and will consider uh, if they are able to set out, if the report uh, uh, sets out ways in which the existing arrangements uh, can be uh, improved, uh, that we will, uh, we will consider uh, doing that. The report uh, was produced uh, last uh, week uh, and I'll be uh, uh, responding to it uh, shortly. And I, I, I am aware, uh, I should say as well, of your own uh, evidence. So I, I'm, I'm very alive uh, to the issue uh, and we are looking at the, the information that, that's been provided to us. Okay, that's heartening. Thank you. Okay, one, uh, another question from Linda Fabiani, this time on what programme issues, Secretary of State, then I think there's only one question after that. So. Uh, hello, Secretary of State. Um, I, I would like to talk about the work programme and where we're at with that. Started off in the Smith Agreement, talking about the devolution of the work programme. We then, when the draft clauses came along, that had been somewhat reduced, um, the level of uh, devolved work programme. Since that point, we've had changes from the UK government. We're now talking about merging of the work programme and work choice, a new programme. And along with that, we have had not only massive budget cuts, which we had confirmed to us, in fact, uh, just recently from your own government, but also extensions of contracts for, for running the work programmes, etc. I wonder, can you, can you give me an idea of what we will see uh, in the agreement that comes to us for scrutiny within the next week or so? It, it won't make specific uh, reference to uh, the work uh, programme or, or work uh, choice. There has been extensive discussion around these arrangements. I participated in some of them uh, myself. Uh, my understanding 
uh, is that the, 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 the Scottish Government uh, took a view, uh, having initially uh, not uh, been sympathetic to the extension of the contracts, that indeed the, what it was necessary to have a period for them to take forward uh, a mechanism to set up their own uh, system of a, uh, equivalence to uh, the work programme and, and work uh, choice. Obviously, the committee uh, wrote to uh, the Minister of State for Employment uh, earlier this month, uh, and, and she did respond on the, on the 19th uh, of February specifically uh, on the, the financial issues, in which she, uh, I think, made clear that there wasn't going to be uh, the level of uh, budget uh, changes that uh, had been uh, suggested. However, I have uh, had a series of discussions with the Deputy First Minister round employability. Uh, as you may know, we have something called the Employability Forum, which brings together the Scottish Government, UK Government and COSLA. And I, I think that we do need uh, to, you know, we do need to find ways of working more closely together, because I take on board the point that you, you know, you make. The Smith Commission agreement on this area was in a, a moment in time. The number of things that have changed, not least uh, the, uh, the number of people in employment, a record number which I think we would all uh, welcome. Uh, but you know, we need to continue to work together in the area of employability. You're saying then that there's still negotiation going on on that? I'm saying that I'm saying that, the, I'm saying that there's, you know, there's still discussion, you know, there's still discussion that the two governments would want to have about improving employability uh, arrangements within Scotland. That's not uh, agreeing before it is somehow interpreted as saying that we're uh, agreeing to some Smith Plus provision. That's not what we're uh, that's not what we're seeking to do. But we're seeking to come to the most effective arrangements for employability within Scotland, bringing together all those who have a specific interest, being the UK government, Scottish government, and COSLA. Uh, thank you. I'm sure if you did want to talk about Smith Plus, we'd be very happy to do so. <laughs> I, I know. I know you. I know you would. Uh, I know. I know you would. Uh, but I, you know, I, I do. You know, I, I'm not. You know, what I'm trying to, I'm trying to be, you know, offer a reasonable way forward because I accept Smith, you know, the Smith Agreement in relation to em, em, employment programmes is at a moment of time where in, these things evolve. We've, we've got to, uh, you know, we've worked to work together as we go forward. But I do think, you know, I think Ms Patel's letter of the 19th of February, you know, does address the, 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 the financial uh, concerns, but of course we'll continue to uh, we'll continue uh, a dialogue with the Scottish Government on employability more generally. Thank you. I'll leave the last question. Thank I think you. it will be Secretary of State to Mark Macdonald. Gosh, what privilege! Um, <laughs> Secretary of State, can I um, ask? Obviously, the Scotland Bill com completed its committee stage in the House of Lords yesterday. Um, are you in a position as yet to advise whether it's the intention of the government to make any further amendment to the Scotland Bill at report stage or at third reading, um, and if so, in what areas? Um, obviously, the committee has previously highlighted areas where it wishes to see amendment to the bill. Um, are you able to give us any further information at this stage? The parking one? Yeah, no, that, that will be later. The... Uh, the, the um, Amendments that will come forward at this stage are only technical amendments uh, in terms of uh, improving uh, the uh, language of, of the bill. Those are amendments which have been uh, agreed with uh, the Scottish Government. There are some amendments uh, which will be lodged on Thursday uh, which are consequent so, of the fiscal framework and in particular uh, in terms of the adjustment to the borrowing uh, powers, but, uh, but uh, that, so there will be fiscal uh, framework uh, amendments. It is our intention to bring forward an amendment again, which we have agreed uh, with the Scottish Government to support legislation uh, in relation to uh, pa parking on the pavement, uh, which uh, the Scottish Government want to uh, address, and, and it's seen that the bill as an opportunity to do that expeditiously. Uh, but it is not in, the government does not intend to bring forward any other uh, other amendments, and it's not minded uh, to accept any amendments which have been suggested 
uh, by the opposition parties in the House of Lords. Okay, that's uh, good, to, good to get the, the government's thinking on that. We'll per perhaps probe it further as a committee as we scrutinise. Okay, th th Secretary, thank you very much for coming um, to, to give this on behalf have this evening. It's been very helpful to understand the UK government's position. Can I just ask that it, you'll be able to make yourself available um, sometime next week, I think, um, to, to take further evidence once we've seen the the colour of the ink on the agreement and potentially any other UK Treasury Minister we might decide to, disc to, to at that time, it would be most helpful. And thank you for coming along. I, no, I, I, I'm absolutely uh, happy to uh, give uh, that uh, undertaking. I, I'm very you know, pleased to be able to um, you know, engage with uh, the committee. You know, it's very important that the fiscal framework uh, and indeed other, other aspects of the bill are, uh, are properly uh, scrutinised and I don't have any uh, difficulty uh, with doing that. You know, some have suggested that this, these arrangements have been conducted in secret. They haven't. They have been conducted in the way in which important negotiations have to be conducted. But what's important is the agreement that's been reached. I think that it is a significant agreement for Scotland uh, an agreement that's fair to Scotland, fair to the rest of the UK, and I'm very happy uh, to uh, participate in any further scrutiny of it. Thank you very much. I now close this meeting.